Welcome to Video Hell Show. My name is Frank, and this winter is the winter of 99. Today I'm going to talk about three movies uh, that were released in the year 1999. Not really, in one case that I found out a little bit later. We'll get there. Um, but uh, I watched three really shitty movies for y'all this time. Uh, there's no real other way to put it. Before I get too far ahead of myself, the movies that I chose to talk about this week are uh, Strip for Action... The Life Before This and Nowhere Land. So uh, let's waste uh, let's waste no time. Let's jump right into it here and talk about the first movie, which was Strip for Action. So let's take a look here at the uh, at the box, read a little bit off of it, and we'll go from there. This is starring Maria Ford and uh, Amo Levisetti. I can't really read the full tagline here on the front because uh, it was covered up by a sticker that says S, which is a lovely detail. But uh, I'll just read what I can see, like I usually do. She's stripped for a living, now to live. I kind of like that. Strip for action. Uh, on the back here... I'll read a little bit, as I always do, off the back of the box. Continuing in the genre that made her famous, Maria Ford stars as Kim, a stripper caught in the crossfire when her strip joint is robbed. Hey, are you purposely not listening to me, honey? With her boyfriend, Vic, played by uh, Kevin, I think that's Kevin Contreras, and another dancer, Stacy, played by Nikki Fritz, they're taken hostage by the robbers. By the robbers, not by robbers, by the robbers. En route to Las Vegas, their small plane crashes in the middle of a remote lake. Uh, Kim and Stacy are pulled from the wreckage by robbers and led on a grueling trek through the mountains. Night after night, the two are threatened and forced to perform their sexy routines for the robbers in a desperate attempt to stay alive. That's not true, really. When dancing no longer keeps the men satisfied, carnal pleasure. Uh, when dancing no longer keeps the men satisfied, <laughs> carnal pleasure becomes the girl's only chance for survival. It makes it seem so much sleazier than it is, even though it's terribly sleazy. Filled with tantalizing action and beautiful bodies, prepare yourself to see just how far a woman will go. It's too far, and at the same time, not far enough. Running time, a cool 77 minutes. I forgot to tell you, the uh, men's room is all messed up. It's a burst pipe or something. So you want to use the girls' room unless you want to get crap all over those awful shoes. Joey, my mom gave me these. That's how much content we get out of this film. So that there a that right there kind of tells you what you're in for. Uh, released by New Horizons Home Video in 1999. Originally released as a movie called Hot Ticket in 1995. I guess New Horizons bought it and re-released it uh, because Hot Ticket makes no sense and Strip for Action makes only a little bit more sense. So uh, in the first scene, we waste no time. We get right into a strip club and we see, uh, of course, naked women. This movie stars uh, more or less Maria Ford, as mentioned on the front. And uh, on the back, she is uh, like a queen of 1990s low-budget action and horror films, most of which she is famous for getting nude in. Exploitative to the max, that was the era, that's what we're dealing with. Mostly crappy movies and the only reason people would end up buying them, mostly men I would assume, is because they get to see the same people naked over and over again. You know, awesome. Anyway, so we're introduced in the beginning to Maria Ford as Kim. She's the one who's stripping in the beginning, uh, as I said. And we're also introduced to some of her co-workers and some of the rest of the characters in the movie, who are all people she is essentially connected to. Her uncle owns the strip joint, her uh, current boyfriend is the manager, and her ex-boyfriend Frank is the bartender. Basically, uh, this place gets robbed by someone Frank is connected with. These two guys come in. What is this? Just do what they say, Stu, and no one will get hurt. What do you want, my wallet? It's no problem. Uh, uh, hands. One's kind of uh, debonair and the other's kind of dirtbaggy. Kind of reminds me of Cousin Eddie from National Lampoon's Vacation. Freeze, dirtbag. Somebody's been watching a little too many police shows on the TV. So the polished guy, uh, named by, I believe goes by the name of Halleck or something like that, in the movie uh, is played by uh, Emil uh, Lavacetti, who ended up going on to have a very uh, good TV career producing and directing television. He directed, um, I think, like Suits. He did some episodes of Bones. And uh, he directed, I believe directed, he might have produced, uh, a show on TBS that I really enjoyed called Wrecked. Uh, and I highly recommend, uh, rather than watching any of these three movies I'm about to talk about, go watch the TV show Wrecked and then 
tweet at or, you know, whatever, anyone who was instrumental in making that show happen for more seasons because it ended too soon and it was a damn good show. So that's what I'd rather talk about. Maybe I'll do an episode all about the show Wrecked because that show was fucking amazing. Um, so this guy went on to do great things. And this movie's actually not bad. He's he's hamming it up. He's really chewing up the scenery. Ah! Ah! Oh, Jesus. Now, Stu, these rounds cost me about $1.29 a piece. But I'm willing to part with the money. He's not a great actor. He's not a bad actor. He's, he's a serviceable actor. And he's, you know, delivering some terrible dialogue in uh, a way with a decent smirk. He was a handsome guy back then. So watching him was one of the more interesting things to actually see in the movie. The two dudes rob the place, kill Kim's uncle, kidnap everybody, get into a plane, crash the plane in a lake like they say on the back of the box in a really funny sequence. I'll play that here because it's funny as hell watching this plane crash. <laughs> God, you killed him. We're all gonna die. Grab the controls! Frank! Grab the controls! Pull us up! Pull us up! Pull us up! Pull us up! Um, lots of terrible uh, sound effects. The same sound effect used for all of the gunshots. Their guns have suppressors. Every gunshot has the same, same sound. I'm begging you. I got a wife, a kid. I hope they're better at their jobs than you were. It's really obnoxious. The rest of the movie, after they crash the plane, takes place in the cheapest uh, place to shoot any movie ever, the desert, uh, or, excuse me, the woods. It takes place in the woods. <clears throat> Most low-budget movies will end up shooting in the woods because it's the cheapest place that you almost don't have to pay for, if at all, or even get permission for. Uh, I'm sure you do sometimes. But, you know, all shit movies are shot in the woods. It's almost a guarantee. They go into the woods, and uh, like it says on the box, there's a couple times where... The one girl, Nikki, who, I think, no, maybe Nikki's her real name, whatever, the, the stripper friend of Kim undergoes immediate Stockholm Syndrome and starts getting attached to the suave divinaire bad guy, who's the only one left. The plane crashes, by the way, because Cousin Eddie guy gets shot in the back and then they crash. She gets hardcore Stockholm Syndrome, so much so that she ends up turning on her friend, which makes no sense. Crystal, come on. You're not a killer. I swear to God, if you don't shut up, I'll shoot you. Um, and she uh, strips for the bad guy, but then they end up like getting together almost, more or less. That's the whole kind of thing that happens, and then eventually she gets killed. One of the best things in the whole movie that happens, though, is they eventually steal this raft from these two people that are out rafting. Kill them, of course. Why would they leave them alive? It's ridiculous. Can you help me? I'm lost. shoot her you lose them please wait my sister she's delirious from hunger what are you doing out here in that ghetto haven't you ever seen a cheerleader before um but they get into what's essentially like a really small like two maybe three person tops calm river raft down to anything you say baby or something you might want to just take in a pool it barely looks like a real boat uh, inflatable raft and they cut between scenes of all four of them in this raft and then it'll cut to a wide shot really far away of them going down rapids eventually and it's obviously like two stuntmen definitely not the two actors Frank as far as I can tell all you know how to do is mix water down drinks lose money gambling and wine so don't tell me what I do or don't have to do.
rowing a gigantic boat that is nowhere near the same size as the one that you see in the close-ups. And then every once in a while, when they want to show a close-up of the people rowing, it'll be shot from down low up against trees. And it looks like what they did was they had these guys on a rig on the back of a truck that they were driving around wooded areas and were throwing water out of bottles at their faces. It's absolutely hilarious. As the movie uh, as the movie starts to wrap up, we're treated to not one but two scenes of people getting trapped against the cliff. Um, one dude is a innocent bystander who witnesses what's going on and gets forced up against a cliff, and then he jumps or gets shot or shot. He gets shot, falls off, and it's the, the it's so grisly. What do you want? You want some food? Look, take it. I got some money. I got some weed. Do you have a pair of wings? But it was funny because of the, the dummy they used and the way they shot. <laughs> but it was actually kind of gross and disturbing at the same time. <laughs> so I'm of two minds about that, but it was actually, you know, one of the more interesting things to happen. So the whole time, too, Kim's uh, boyfriend, who was the strip club manager, um, has been alive. Uh, they kind of should have saved that for somewhere near the end to make it somewhat surprising or kind of add a twist. Didn't do that. You knew he was alive the whole time. Didn't matter. No one cares. And he shows up at the end to save the day, jumps off a cliff, uh, gets the bad guy's gun, shoots him in the neck, and anticlimactically just kind of ends. <laughs> That was stripped for action. Um, needless to say, that movie was lackluster. I'd go ahead and skip that one if I were you. Unless, uh, unless maybe you're some kind of Maria Ford completist, um, and if you are, you're a fucking pervert and you should re-examine what the hell you're doing with your life. Uh, and yeah. In search of uh, a decent movie to watch, the next thing I watched was uh, The Life Before This, and it made me kind of wish I'd gone back to a life before I had watched this piece of shit movie. Uh, <laughs> that's... It's actually kind of harsh, but at the same time, not at all. So the movie starts out on uh, the shot of a coffee shop from across the street and like kind of changes into this visual effect that reminds me sort of like um, the posterization uh, filter in Photoshop or the uh, or the bass relief filter. I'm not sure exactly uh, what the hell it was meaning to do. He does it a couple times, the director or the editors or whoever did it throughout the film. Didn't really add anything, just kind of took you out of it and was stupid. Then we go inside the coffee shop, and it's all handheld shooting, and almost looks exactly like The Office or Parks and Rec. I guess, uh, what do you want? Coffee? Oh, yeah. I'll have a decaf, something, cappuccino, I guess. It's also almost like they changed the frame rate to 30 or 60, and it's not, at, it might not be at 24, I'm not 100% certain, but it just changes the complete look of the film. It was a very strange choice, didn't add anything to the film, it also, again, just kind of took me out of it because the rest of the movie is shot. Uh, with decent cinematography, good choices, might have been an afterthought, I don't, I don't really know, it doesn't make any sense. So we open up on this coffee shop, like I said, at night. P people enter, and we know as viewers of the movie, and if you hadn't read the box even, or if you hadn't seen any marketing material, you'd know that these are the people that we're going to set up for the rest of the film. We don't get introduced too intimately to anyone. We just kind of hear them interact with one another, don't get a real sense of who they are so much. And then two dudes break into the place and shoot everybody after an argument. and a bunch of people are dead. Uh, the front window breaks, and then it freeze frames, and then the window reverses back into place. <laughs> and 
and then we get the rest of the movie. And the rest of the movie is kind of uh, what uh, is called a composite film or a hyperlink film. I've heard it described in two different ways. I can't tell you exactly which one this is, so in the comments, if you know for sure, leave me uh, down here in the comments which it is if you really are into film theory. Essentially, it's a bunch of stories that are not connected to one another other than the fact that everyone that is kind of involved ends up in the coffee shop at the end. And we're in the coffee shop at the beginning, but not even everyone, which is, is stupid. A lot of people, so you, you follow all these different characters through their stories, which don't really have anything to do with one another. And they're just kind of meandering. You meander with, with these stories. Overall, honestly, they're kind of boring. That said, um, one of the real reasons to watch this movie is the performances. Catherine O'Hara, who I love, uh, of Schitt's Creek and Home Alone fame is in this, gives a great performance. He got off and he sang to her at the wedding. Oh, it sounds harmless, right? But then, see, you start picturing it. Going to dinner, wondering the whole time who's going to pay for it. Then you're stuck there, listening to him tell me his problems with his mother. And I'm thinking, what is this, a salad course? What if he wants dessert? Well, there's no law that says you have to order dinner when you go out on the first date. I'm not going to a bar. I went to a bar once on a first date with a guy who got totally bombed on tequila and took off his pants. Stephen Ray gives a really good, almost chilling performance in this movie in his little section. I'm not usually like this. It's just bugs, you know, in my house where I live. Look at it this way. You think it's your house, but really it's part of a whole thing. The city laid out over the world. We're in it, the insects, the squirrels, everything the same. Oh, somehow that frightens me more. Oh, if it's true, then nothing matters. How could it? You can't change what happens. Jacob Tierney of Letterkenny fame is in this for a short beat. I love this. You have your history books and the kitchen supplies in a box that is marked bedroom. And what, pray tell, is this lovely little piece of equipment? I want to show you later. <laughs> and he does, a, do, does good enough work, and I love Jacob Tierney, love Letterkenny. If you're not watching Letterkenny, do yourself a favor and watch that. And uh, Emily Hampshire is in this too, of Schitt's Creek fame, uh, Stevie uh, from Schitt's Creek, and she's good in this too, playing a would-be actor who works in this coffee shop. Um, goes out for an acting role, thinks she doesn't get it, gets it, reminds me a little bit of her character in Schitt's Creek. Everything in the movie is kind of connected to this one line that Catherine O'Hara has that's, uh, everything almost doesn't happen. Everything almost doesn't happen. So it's almost like the Schrodinger's cat of movies, that essentially, or, or the quantum physics of movies. Y you don't really know what any of these stories, or what any, what, what's gonna happen until it does happen, or any anything that could have happened could be changed by one little decision or choice. Uh, I guess that's obvious, but that said, it's not exactly the best subject for this movie, because the movie essentially is meaningless because of that, but we'll get there in a sec. Alison Pill of uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World has a really weird scene where she's like a, a schoolgirl. I don't know if she's supposed to be in high school or middle school. She looks extremely young. Her friends have some really uncomfortable sexual dialogue, and then she eventually ends up trying to, uh, to the face of her elderly French teacher, tries to threaten him. I'm not worried about your French grade, certainly. <laughs> Well, today, after the exam, 
you looked right up my skirt. And I want you to give me Phoebe's or I'll tell everyone. I'll tell them you touched me and my friend. And they'll know it's true. Everyone knows about it. Uh, for, I believe, a good grade, like saying that I, I, somebody told me or I know you looked up my skirt and I'll tell people. And he, she threatens him directly and he ends up basically like being like, fuck you, I don't care. <laughs> he, I know I didn't do it. And uh, at the end of the movie, he ends up kind of like saving her in a way, which is weird. Anyway, the movie kind of ends up with all or most of the players, like I said, not all of them, back in this coffee shop. And we now have, though, the story of the two people who had robbed it earlier, which I'm going to be honest. I watched it. Don't really get it. I couldn't remember or tell if they were friends or cousins or something. Uh, these two live with a woman. One of them is dating the woman. Those the, the woman hates the the one guy because she thinks he's crazy. Get it? He's out. Cool. What was the problem? He's sitting on the john playing with a gun. Oh, for fuck's sake. Now, Nick, he's loading the gun. Oh, come here. Um, they go to rob this place, then they crash the car into a van out in front of this coffee shop. Go, 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 go! Turn here! Turn it! Turn! 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 <laughs> they run in, they argue, the two guys argue over, like, getting a cut of the money, start shooting at each other. That's what had happened in the beginning scene too, but this time now different people end up dying and less people die But not really as a direct result of anything you had seen throughout the rest of the film Like none of the stuff that they had done individually really carries any weight and the only real tie-in that I that I noticed so much And I'm I'm pretty observant, but the only real tie-in with uh, French teacher the elderly French teacher uh, You know wrapping his arms around Alison Pill so she doesn't get shot Showing that he's going, to, he would just sacrifice himself or wants to protect her, even though she threatened him, which is, I guess, great characterization. It, it shows some, some, it shows something. But we didn't have anything from these characters before they were in the coffee shop and got killed the first time. Had we had like 15 minutes or 30 minutes worth of build up to see what these characters did to get them into the coffee shop the first time and get killed, and then saw what could have gotten them what would have made that change or what decisions they could have made different to make that change, then I think it would have had some weight. But because we had no idea who these people were before they got killed and then we saw a whole movie where they did stuff and then some didn't get killed and some still did, doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, of course, if you did any one thing in your day differently, different things could end up happening at the end of the day. No shit. But that doesn't mean you make a whole movie around that premise because it's meaningless at the end of the day if we don't know what the stakes were. And that drove me nuts. <laughs> you could argue if you gave those characters more in the beginning that it would kind of ruin, I guess, the, the artsy concept of the movie. But still, I just, in my opinion, it doesn't make sense. I think if you had focused e like on any one of these character stories, like Stephen Ray's character does some chilling stuff. Like Alison Pill, there's some weird shit going on there, but not in ways I haven't seen. Like in a movie called Welcome to the Dollhouse, very similar to the stuff that Alison Pill does. And... I mean, uh, coming of age kind of stuff, which is uncomfortable to watch, but a lot of us went through. So, like, these things make sense, but on their own, compartmentalized into movies that maybe would have had some weight if it was just fixated on their characters. Like, Stephen Ray has a dead daughter, and he's very emotional, and he does some great acting, but, again, I don't have any fucking stakes. I don't, so I don't care. Anyway, this movie is boring as shit. Uh, great, some great performances, uh, but it should, it's from Canada. It was made and produced and filmed and financed by Canada as a lot of stuff up there is. I love Canada, love Canadian comedy. 
Uh, if this is the kind of stuff that dramatically comes out of Canada, even to this day, I haven't watched much of the recent Canadian drama, so I can't say, but I'm sorry, Canada, if this is what you're giving us, and this is what you're putting out in the world, stick to comedy, because you do that very well. A uh, lot of great Canadian comedy, Kids in the Hall, uh, Letter Kenny, uh, Kim's Convenience, Schitt's Creek, I could go on and on, tons of great comedians from, uh, from Canada, Ryan Reynolds, Mike Myers, Keep giving us comedy because you do that fucking fantastically. But if this is the quality of drama that comes out of Canada, um, no fucking thank you. Last movie I'm talking about is called Nowhere Land. <sighs> That's where it felt like my fucking brain went when I watched it. Anyway, this movie stars Peter Dobson and Dina Meyer. Uh, the mob's been thrown some unexpected curves. I guess they're her curves. They certainly weren't I don't know what the fuck else they could be talking about. Even though a lot of things do have curves. I mean, this table has a curve and this microphone has curves and this has curves. It's backdrop, I guess. And like, lots of stuff. Unless it has corners. Like, this box has corners. But if you look at it close enough, it has curves too. So, maybe that's what they were talking about. The Pursuit of Passion with a Vengeance. This movie sucks. When the FBI's biggest case hinges... Key, uh, when the FBI's biggest case hinges on keeping a key witness, Peter Dobson of Doppelganger, alive, bet that the mob will send their best to take him out. <laughs> Not even remotely true after watching this film. Fucking lies. But when the feds send a girl, a <laughs> girl, Dina Meyer of Starship Troopers, with a lot of guts and a whole lot of secrets to keep their man secure, no one is more surprised than the mob's assassins, played by Francisco Quinn of Platoon and John Polito of The Big Lebowski. When sparks fly. Mm, okay. When ferociously intense, oh shit, the ferociously intense showdown will have you gripping your seat. I don't know about that, maybe to throw it against the fucking television. Bye. Oh man, action, also made in 1999, 88 minutes, thank the fucking Spaghetti Monster. Made by Avalanche Films and distributed by Avalanche Home Entertainment, Flashpoint presents a 723, whatever, 7.23, it's not a gun caliber, whatever. This movie sucked balls. Yeah. So, I watched two shit movies and I was gonna make just a double uh, header episode, but I figured we'll go for the triple, uh, triple header and maybe try to find a movie that would redeem those other two pieces of crap, and that didn't happen, not even a little bit. This movie, um, made me sad. I thought, and I thought, since we had Dina Meyer, that this was going to be a good movie. Dina Meyer was great in Starship Troopers. She's a fantastic actress. She's beautiful. I, you know, whole package. I should have noticed that she was second built to Peter Dobson, who, who's been in a lot of good movies, um, but he's delisted best. And uh, I love the cynicism of Hollywood to, you know, even maybe to this day, it's, it's toned down a bit. But they used to just throw the uh, beautiful lady, uh, talented lady, on the front of the cover, um, and then make them second fiddle to a D-list male celebrity who is like watching um, coat bloat toast roll around in a bunch of mud. Anyway, the movie follows uh, Dobson's character, Dean, who flips on the mob, goes into hiding in, you guessed it, the fucking woods, so they could shoot cheaply. Uh, he goes out and Ninja Turtle ones it in some shitty desert hovel. Davy Crockett. It's about goddamn time, man. Well, I told you, two days. Uh, and fights with some fucking stupid chickens that he keeps in his house, but doesn't like in his house, even though he keeps the fucking doors open. I don't know, man. <laughs> He's eventually, uh, and essentially, is saved by Dina Meyer, uh, who protects him uh, and saves him from two inept hitmen. I cannot breathe, Frank. Breathe through your nose and shut your mouth. Why do you have to be like this? Why are you always like this? What, are you getting sensitive on me? Killers are not sensitive people. Yes, but you say just breathe it through your nose and then... Uh, my nose is not just for the breathe. My nose <laughs> smell of the woman, smell of the flower. Who they say are great on the box, but are played by Francisco Quinn and John Polito, who on their own are good actors. Francisco Quinn, uh, he's been in a couple things, Platoon, he was pretty good. It wasn't a huge role, but it was good. And um, Polito, who, you know, I love. He was in It's Always Sunny, plays Frank's brother. That episode's great. I think he's uh, he's a fantastic actor, a little great character actor. Um, but their characters are like caricatures. They're not real. They don't act like hitmen, especially in movies of today. Like, movies back in the 80s and 90s would do a hitman, and sometimes it would be, you know, sleek and cool, like the professional or something like that. But in a lot of movies, they kind of show them as like bumbling idiots almost. 
And this one's definitely like that. They're supposed to be like suave. Um, one of them's like an Italian stereotype. Frank or Alfredo? Alfredo, how you doing? Alfredo with a doppia V. Whoa, Alfredo. Catch his name. My sister, she called me from Italy yesterday. Uh, she called me all the way from Italy, from the Abruzzi, to tell me that I'm the CEO. I have the nephew. I have never met my nephew, but I love him. And the other's a f New York Italian stereotype. Next week I'd be in New Jersey, I'd be in Bayonne or Hoboken. If I stayed in the family, I might have ended up in a Brucey. Yeah, we could have had dinner. I wouldn't have been there for dinner. Like, they they don't have a lot of substance. Then they get together, they odd couple it, they argue, they become friends. And then there's some really anticlimactic gunfighting. <laughs> And uh, a really shitty uh, thing where you think um, Dina Meyer is going to push the hitman off of a cliff with her car, but only just rams into it a couple times really lightly uh, and pushes it off of a hill. And then uh, Polito gets bit by a snake. And it's a callback to earlier when, sh when you know, um, white bread Dobson. Uh, helps Dina Meyer not get bit by a rattlesnake. I don't know, who fucking cares? And that was Nowhere Land. Uh, the asshole who wrote this even found a way to work the title into the script and had two throwaway characters uh, actually say it. I'm sorry, buddy. You're just gonna have to stay here in, uh, what did we call it? Nowhere, Nowhere land. land. Nowhere Land. In a line. Oh, fuck. Sorry. I fell asleep while thinking about that. I guess I either have narcolepsy or I shouldn't watch these shitty movies anymore. <laughs> and that was Nowhere Land. Thanks for watching Video Hell Show. No, really. Thanks for watching Video Hell Show, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Frank. I appreciate you watching. Um, you know, like and subscribe if you like what you've seen. If you stuck with it this long, you're a trooper. Uh, keep watching because I'm going to keep watching shitty movies for you so you don't have to. Uh, or you could be a real trooper and watch him with me if you want. I fucking dare you. Uh, and uh, hopefully I'll be back here uh, very shortly with some more trash and maybe hopefully a good movie uh, to talk about pretty soon. Uh, have a good one. Peace, everybody. Later.